you, the key point is really for prioritizing women's health is staying physically active, mentally healthy, and cognitive health. So those are the three components, along with many others, that are the tenets to healthy aging. So why are women living longer? Well, this awareness and greater emphasis, but really a lot of it also has to do in the 1920s and 30s, we didn't have screening tests or screening guidelines. Now we have all these wonderful new guidelines, data and science to support the importance of screening tests and guidelines, such as having an annual well woman exam, cervical pap smears, and in some instance, anal pap smears, mammograms, mammograms have come a long way blood tests, cardiac test. I was the previous American Heart Association Go Red for Women uh, chair of the Coachella Valley several years ago. And my main message was that women die of heart disease equally as men. It's the number one killer of women and men. So being very acutely aware of cardiac disease in women as much as men is key, very important. Also, like I said, this greater emphasis on health of thriving, not just surviving. So having these, all of these modalities for well-being, increased access to healthcare, scientific advances in medicine, focus on prevention and importance of a healthy lifestyle. Recommended health screenings. So science and the medical community have given us some guidelines for annual, biannual, and this algorithm of when women should have testing, such as every man and woman or any gender relation in between on the other side and around, everybody should have a full physical exam every year. Every year, a woman should have a well woman exam a pelvic exam and a breast exam. I'll get to the points on if you should have a pap smear or not in a little bit on a different slide. But generally, women starting at the age of 21 should have a pap smear per their individual history. And I'll get to that more. Mammogram yearly starting at age 40. Colonoscopy every 10 years. It used to be starting at age 50 and that was recently moved to age 45. And it could be earlier depending on a person's family history. There's also other alternative stool testing, but the gold standard still is colonoscopy. Laboratory testing, checking your lipids, your cholesterol, whole panel, blood sugar, thyroid, that should be tested at least every one to five years, and bone density after menopause every one to five, excuse me, one to three years as well. So we have all these guidelines now of when and what tests to have. So things are organized as far as the general testing. Now, often I get a question from women is how often do they need to have a gynecological exam? And like I said, every year you should have a pelvic and a breast exam by your primary care provider. Why? Those are body parts that need to be examined. Just like you should have your heart listened to, your lungs, your eyes, your ears, your nose, those body parts should be examined. What's the difference between a pelvic exam and a pap smear? Quite simply, a pelvic exam is an anatomical exam and a pap smear is a lab test. So the anatomical exam of a pelvic exam is when your primary care provider, your nurse practitioner, your gynecologist, your doctor goes in and does a manual exam, presses, you know, around the pelvis, feels inside, and depending on age, does a rectal exam as well. And then if you're in the category when you're, if you're due for a cervical pap smear, or if you have your cervix removed through hysterectomy, is when that uh, practitioner would gather the lab test of collecting cells from the cervix and send that off to the lab for a pap smear or if the cervix is missing or surgically absent, then they would collect cells from the vaginal cuff or the cuff, the cervical, the vaginal cuff where the cervix used to be and um, send that off. And then I also have patients that are, have a history of HPV that would need to have an anal pap. And if that's abnormal, that's when they would see me for my current position to have a high resolution anoscopy. So wait, what, what's a pap smear test again? Hmm. 
So a pap smear test is looking for abnormal cells in the cervix, if that's where we're collecting it, or from the vagina, if the cervix is missing, or from the anus, if you're in a category that needs to be tested and have an anal pap as well. And what pap smears do is they collect cells and those cells are put in a bottle of formulum, sent to the lab, and the lab looks at those cells underneath the microscope to look at their cellular makeup and also run HPV testing on those cells to see if they pick up HPV or in some cases reflex criteria is met to pick up HPV and if the cells are normal, abnormal, and then that can guide your practitioner on the next steps to take. So pap smears of the cervix are cervical screening tests and cervical cancer screening find abnormal cells that can then lead to other testing if that's abnormal. And cancer occurs when cervical cells, you know, can be picked up from a cervical pap or at least abnormalities on a cervical pap can lead to the patient having other important testing such as colposcopy, uh, cervical biopsy. And in my case, if I, there is an abnormal anal pap, then I'll do the high, resolu high resolution anoscopy where I'll do anal biopsies. And if those are precancerous, then I can treat them. If certainly if we find cancer, then you would be seeing a specialist such as a gynecological oncological surgeon and or a colorectal surgeon in my case, if I pick up anal uh, abnormal cells. It usually takes these, these abnormal cellular uh, findings, if a woman is having her pap smears done on a regular basis, that's why it's important we do them on a regular basis because it is a slow growing cancer that can take three to seven years. So these screening tests can pick those up in advance of the cellular destruction progressing. And this is a kind of a busy slide of, you know, when women should have pap smears and how often, but your practitioner will know your history and your age and can factor this in for you and inform you. So this is more information regarding this cervical cancer screening. I kind of belabor this because it's an easy test um, and economical that's covered by insurance that can really be very informative. And this talks about what to do. So these are the other testings. You may need a colposcopy and other things if you have abnormal cancer uh, screening tests. HPV, which is the virus that causes these abnormal cells in a cervical or an anal or a vaginal pap. Uh, HPV is a virus. We do now have a vaccine, which are for our young teenage girls and boys, and also up to the age of 45, if you have risk factors, you could receive the vaccine. And HPV is responsible for nine cancers in the body. So I do recommend that you um, consider getting an HPV vaccine series if you've not had that, or just discussing that with your provider if you're at risk for additional exposures, wherever you are in your um, timeline of life. So can women stop having pelvic exams? Only if, um, you know, you can stop having pap smears if you don't have a cervix, but you really should still have those pelvic exams. Um, so this is an important point regarding that. Um, all women should have pelvic exams. It's just the routine cervical cancer screening through pap smears may be different for different women. So let's talk about breast cancer. So we've covered below the belly button, let's go above the belly button. So why do we screen for breast cancer? Breast cancer survival is directly related to the size of cancer at the time of diagnosis. The smaller the breast cancer, the better the outcome. So this is all about women living longer and aging well. If we can do all these screening tests, cervical, pap smears, mammograms, colonoscopies, anoscopies, other testing, you're going to live longer and age um, better. So it's much more productive to find smaller lesions than it is larger lesions. So overall, mammography screening has reduced breast cancer mortality by 20 to 30%. So this is another reason why women are living longer. 
um, breast cancer risk, all women at risk, 75% of um, women or men diagnosed with uh, breast cancer have no family history. So um, just because you don't have any family history of breast cancer does not mean you're not at risk. So it's very important that starting at age 40, you have an annual mammogram. This is also the mammogram algorithm. Um, there are some women that are at higher risk that may need to start screenings at an earlier age and so forth. And it also talks about other risk groups and other screening tests for the breast, which may include uh, whole breast ultrasound and mammogram and MRI, but the gold standard is always a mammogram. And here at Eisenhower, we have the new mammogram technology, the tomosynthesis, which is a, a conventional digital mammogram, but it produces a 3D image. So it makes seeing smaller cancers much, much easier. Doesn't involve any more additional uh, films or radiation. It's the same. It's just that the machinery is advanced. And we're very lucky to have an incredible robust breast center here at Eisenhower that has the 3D mammogram. As you can see from this example, a lesion that is not well seen on the left, which is a traditional mammogram, is seen very clearly on the right, which is the 3D tomosynthesis mammogram. So another way women can age well and stay alive and healthy is to have breast cancers or lesions caught very early at a very small so small, small size. So let's talk about hormones, right? Okay, this is another thing that women like to bring up is what about hormone replacement therapy? Well, just like all these shoes, no one shoe size or style fits all. Hormone therapy is very vast and it's all throughout a woman's life, right? When she's a younger woman, she's concerned about birth control and the different modalities for that. In middle life, you know, it's childbearing years and if they elect to have children. And then later in life, hormones. And if, as we go, as women go through menopause and if they should have hormone replacement therapy, there are lots of options. The best answer to that is talking about your personal risk factors, your personal symptoms. If a woman has not that big of symptoms with menopause, but she has a high family history of trouble taking hormones or breast cancers or other things that she may be concerned about, then it might be better for her to not take hormones during menopause. And other women that have, you know, a lot of symptoms that's really affecting their quality of life, then it may be more beneficial for them to take hormones. But that's an individual tailored discussion with your specialist that's seeing you for that. And other things like vaginal dryness that women have as they start to age. Uh, you can use vaginal estrogen creams that doesn't really affect anything systemically, doesn't increase any risk. You don't get any benefit systemically like for hot flashes, but it can help keep the vaginal tissue more uh, pliable and less dry. So you're going to have less UTIs and better vaginal health. And so those are discussions to have with your primary care provider and your gynecologist as women start to age a bit, what their options are. And there are new options all the time um, as far as different modalities of treatments and hormones. And we have a plethora of testing and new advances available. So certainly talk to your provider about what would be best for you because it should be individual to each, each woman, each person individually. I mentioned heart health earlier and it's very important and more emphasis needs to be placed on heart health. And just like any other health um, concern for a woman, it really comes down to healthy eating and healthy exercise, right? So I have this picture of this lovely heart made out of lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, eating five servings of fruit and vegetables daily to make sure you get plenty of fiber, a lot of uh, healthy vitamins and minerals is very is still very essential. It's all those things that we heard about earlier in you know growing up. It's you know eating healthy, 
It's getting plenty of sleep, getting exercise. It's a balance. If you read the Blue Zone uh, book, it talks about community involvement, exercise, eating healthy, and uh, a purpose in life, finding a community like the center that brings people together for a shared community and shared, um, shared vision for their community. This all brings about longer life and healthy aging. So healthy eating, there's different modalities and there's different diets out there. Um, starting off with foods with a low glycemic index. Uh, so foods that have high uh, fiber content, um, those are gonna release the natural sugars in a slower manner. So you're less likely to get a rush of sugar. So carbohydrates that break down slowly, that release glucose slower in the bloodstream. So those are fruits and vegetables versus something like a processed food that's like a cookie or crackers or things that appear to be healthy, but they're you know out of a box or a can or a bat. I used to work in cardiology many years ago before I was in women's health. And I used to tell all my cardiac patients, don't eat anything out of a box, can or a bag, unless it's maybe frozen vegetables. And if so, make sure there's not a salty sauce associated with it. So eating more whole foods, if you choose to go plant-based, if you choose to do Mediterranean or just lean proteins, um, but always include a lot of healthy fruits and vegetables and whole grains and try to eat whatever you eat um, that's less processed, only one or two ingredients, make food at home. We have a lot of you know health food restaurants now, um, gravitate to those, eat half of your plate, um, read ingredients, read labels, that will help you make better health choices. Exercise trend, so health maintenance versus weight loss. We, to just maintain the weight you have, that's 30 minutes, five times a week. If you want to lose weight, you really need to speed up your exercise to 60 to 90 minutes most days. And this is, of course, with you consulting your doctor, nurse practitioner, physician about what is a healthy, safe exercise program for you. For heart disease, keeping um, movement at least three days out of the week. And for bone health, at least three days out of the week with strength training, which is important for women as we start to go through the menopause uh, section of life, it's important that we do add strength training and weight bearing exercise to help support our bones. So wrapping it up, I know I touched heavy on certain areas as far as screening tests um, and uh, overall health as well, but you could sum up healthy aging really is about staying active, eating healthy with lots of whole food, and sleeping well and seeing your doctor on a regular basis who will help navigate. You don't have to memorize when all of these tests need to be done. Your primary doctor will help organize those for you, alert you. Are you due for a colonoscopy this year? Are you due for your pap smear? Do you have risk factors where you need to have, you know, a colonoscopy sooner? Have you had your annual mammogram? All of this, your primary care provider will help guide you. And then, you know, keep you in line as far as knowing when your annual full physical exam is due. For women, when your well woman exam is due, which will include a pelvic exam and breast exam annually, pap smear every one to three years starting at age 21 per a woman's individual history, mammogram, like I said, every year starting at age 40. Colonoscopy is really now at age 45. Lab tests, blood tests every one to five years and bone density testing every one to three years for women after menopause. Then after that, all of these healthcare concerns with aging can be tailored to the individual. Bring those questions to your primary care provider, open up a dialogue, have a conversation, and then start integrating and finding support centers and community involvement because it's all also the mental health um, aspect. Even if we're all healthy mentally, we need to stay active and within our communities and help stimulate 
cognitive awareness and that sense of belonging within our community, which is very healthy for mental and cognitive health. So thank you, uh, wishing you all health and happiness here. And I'm happy to open up for some questions. Great, uh, Carrie, thank you so much. And what we'll do is, um, ladies and gentlemen, and whoever, everybody on the call, please feel free to unmute. We'll be sensitive to each other as we don't wanna overspeak each other. Ask some questions, um, whatever's been in the back of your mind, the front of your mind, something on a list somewhere. Carrie has the answer for you, so please feel free to ask a question. Hi, I have a question. Please, yeah. go ahead. So if I have a primary care physician, which I do have, I'm over 65, so do I need an OBGYN if I have a primary care doctor who can do the pelvic exam? What, is there a reason to have both or no. not? If your primary care provider is happy and feels comfortable doing a, a pelvic exam and or pap smear, um, then that's absolutely wonderful. You certainly don't need OB, that's obstetrician. Right. Um, if your primary care provider catches something that seems abnormal on your well woman exam, then they can refer you to a gynecologist. But okay. they are, are very well qualified to do a well woman exam and a pap smear and the basic gynecological well woman portion of your annual exam. Okay, and a well woman exam would include blood work to test for cholesterol yes. normally? It should. Okay, yeah. and you should, do you wanna have that done before you see your doctor or will your doctor prescribe the blood work at the time that you go in for the well woman exam? That's a great question. Different practitioners do it different ways. Oh, okay. Um, some of my patients prefer to have their blood work before so they can talk to me at the time. Some of them wanna come in and we discuss in greater detail what tests are appropriate because we might wanna add other blood tests as we discuss what's going on with them. And then they do it after the exam and they may have a follow-up visit. So each practitioner, each person, it might be different from time. There is no right or wrong there. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. I have a couple, actually, I have a question. Um, what is the best way to find a PCP? I've had um, three in as many years as I've lived in the desert. They've transitioned to other areas. So I'd like someone that's gonna be around a, a while. I've tried the referral line and left a message and not gotten a call back. Mm -hmm. I've taken the list that I received from my insurance company and many of them are not accepting new patients. So I'm sort of at a loss. I hear you and I hear your frustration because I, I see patients frequently that are telling me I can't find a primary care doctor. Um, the good news is, is we're hiring all the time here at Eisenhower. Um, maybe the 365 program might be a good choice for you. You have a little bit more individual time with your provider. They have smaller patient panels. There's other advantages. So I would direct you to the 365 number and have you give that um, number a call. And so they can talk to you about the 365 program we have here at Eisenhower. We have lots of wonderful new onboarding um, physicians that have open practices. And Brett, we can supply that number to the 365 office that patients could call. That, we also that would be have, great. Yes, we also have the resident clinic, which is available if you don't want to go that route, that um, have lots of very qualified doctors that can see patients pretty readily um, and other primary care offices here at Eisenhower, we would be delighted to connect you with. And Brett will probably put those numbers or share that information perhaps in the chat. So you can take a look at that as a resource for you. And I, I'm so sorry you're frustrated. I know it's, um, it's been a unique time in medicine where everybody is, is really taking a proactive step to try and, and maintain and have a primary doctor. Um, and, and that's really a wonderful problem to have. So although it's, it can be worked out and we're helping the community by bringing more doctors on. So thank you. Thank you. And I will put that in the chat momentarily, but let's okay. open up for more questions. Yes.
Any don't, other questions? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Okay. Um, I just have a comment to make. Yes. Um, about HRT. Yes. Um, so I started HRT at age 67. Which okay. In hindsight, of course, I, you know, I just didn't have doctors that would let me do it. Um, okay. But since then, of course, that flawed test of 2004, or 2003, the flawed trials. Um, and so I went through 17 years of hot flashes, lack of sleep, mm -hmm. um, creaky joints, mm -hmm. um, vaginal dryness, uh, fuzzy thinking, all of the awful things. And um, now I have an HRT patch and progesterone and um, I've been on it for seven years, maybe, and it's made a huge difference in my life. I, you know, the quality of life is tremendous. Yes. Um, and the energy boost. And my point about um, the risks of HRT for, you know, people that don't have a history of breast cancer or whatever the risks are, um, is they're now finding that sleep is really important as a health thing. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's not only a quality of life issue, it's a real major health issue. And so it, it, women that are not getting quality sleep for 10 or 17 years mm -hmm. um, because of hot flashes and other menopause issues, you know, I think I have, to, I tell myself that it's worth the risk because the difference to the quality of my sleep has been phenomenal and if you don't get enough sleep you don't have any energy and then you don't work out and you know you don't go and see people and if you're not getting enough sleep you're really not having a decent life and so um i'm a big fan of that my mother was on premarin until she died of a stroke at 91 so you know yay um yes you're a great testimonial for this individual um response that you have had some women don't have a lot of symptoms and they'll find natural without some women have a tremendous improvement in their quality of life by taking a small modest tailored amount of hrt hormone replacement therapy and you're one of those that's had a really robust um, response and a higher quality of life and is willing to you know just be happy with that and take the minimal risk that is associated. And for others, those risks could be different. Um, and so that's a, a lovely testimony and an individual experience uh, anecdotally that you feel you have a lot of well being from your hormone replacement therapy. And that's I, lovely. And I do. Um, and I wish I wish that um, any any women that I talk to that are 50 at this point in time, I push them to talk to their doctors about getting HRT. Um, you know, I'm hoping that as the, the results of that study um, become, I don't know, more available or more people hear about it or whatever, that, that their doctors will let them um, have HRT and, and try it out because it's- And it's maybe more studies will come out later that will show different benefits and risk ratios that are, will be more broad and clear. So good point. Thank you for sharing. Thanks. And then I'll, I'll follow up and make a comment that I'm one of those individuals that had cancer mm -hmm. and my doctor and oncologists and no HRT for me. And so I did some over-the-counter you know, you have to take it for a long period of time to no avail. And so I just on and off deal with the hot flashes. And so I wished I could do HRT. But when you talk about those studies though, so maybe I just need to keep paying attention that maybe someone like me who is, you know, a number of decades past, you know, having dealt with uh, cancer, maybe I would be able to take something. Well, or maybe something will become available. Maybe, you know, the, yeah. it's important that because of your history that your practitioner makes the right choice for you and for yeah. you it might not be hormones at all. 
at all. Because it's just not worth the risk for you. Right. So that's, that's where it's another, you're on the other end of right. that scale of an example where for you, hormones are just too risky and it's mm. not, not advised at all. And the safest choice is to bear out those symptoms and to, you know, try a plant-based diet or, you know, other modalities that are not hormone related. Um, yeah. And so for you, you're the other end of that scale. Right. And you're managing. So um, there, that like that slide that I put up with all those different shoes and one size, one style doesn't fit all. It's very individual. So thank mm -hmm. you for your comment. Mm -hmm. It's extremely valuable and it is important side of this conversation. So yeah, thank you for I, your input. I make do. And then I have this. Oh, look at you. There you go. You got your fan. <laughs> A fan. <laughs> You're burning calories as you're fanning too, oh, very, right? That's right. So that's my yeah. That's my medicine right now. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> and it it doesn't it doesn't uh, raise the energy bill either, does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, but I'll still continue to pay attention, and if, you know, and I'm sure my doctor, you know, he'll he we continue to talk about it, and and I manage, I manage. Yep. It doesn't incapacitate me. I just feel uncomfortable, but I'm still able to function. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Continuing that dialogue and keeping updated, that's, that's really healthy as well. Can I ask on the HRT, is that a conversation people are having with their general doctor or their... Um, their their doctor not the obstetrician but gyno you know, for the oh, yeah for the gyno thank uh, you well if there there's some primary doctors that are really good with hormones and some that would feel more comfortable sending their patients to a gynecologist that are more hormone experts so it's varied but you can definitely start the conversation with your primary mm -hmm. care doctor and and with the gyno so in my case i know my doctor sent me to the gyno so it sounds like it would be that person and can i ask um if it's just sleep related like um to the women that have already spoken up not the hot flashes or the other issues i mean it sounds like for the one person it really helped tremendously and how long if you did choose to experiment, how long are you on something like that before you would see changes in sleep, et cetera? Hormone replacement therapy effectiveness usually takes about six to eight weeks to notice a difference. But once again, talking to your doctor, your primary care provider, and talking about the individual risk and benefits for you, if those treatments are appropriate for you. But if you're asking a blanket question, how long would you notice a difference from taking as you six to eight, 12 weeks maximum it takes, um, you know, you can't take them for a week. And if you don't see a difference, stop them um, unless you have a side effect, of course, but generally those medicines take six, eight, 12 weeks. And is there anything about your blood work that they can look at to have an idea or no? There are some blood tests, yes. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, more questions? <clears throat> or Candace, if you have any questions as well, please feel free. No, I don't have any questions at this time, nor do I want to disclose anything about my personal body right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know too many people on this. <laughs> 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 I know it's a safe place. Not, I'm not saying that. It's just, you know, sometimes this is Absolutely. very personal. But hormonal creams, if you have a heart condition, can be, be a good alternative is all I'm going to say. That the creams can help with some of the vaginal issues. Thank you for sharing. That is very <laughs> true. There are a wide myriad of different vaginal creams and treatments that are quite safe. So I really encourage any woman that's having vaginal dryness, which can start premenopausal and unfortunately worsen as time marches past and, you know, not yes. only during, but past menopause, 
that if you're having dryness and other issues, talk, start a dialogue. There are things for you to try that are safe. And so if one treatment doesn't work, try others, but keep talking if it's not better. Great question. A lot of vaginal dryness, you know, as women, we think we need to over, uh, we're just not washing down there enough. But honestly, if you overwash or you soap, men, women, you know, that area of our body below the belly button doesn't need to be overwashed or you're not necessarily dirty. Just rinsing and avoiding soaps can be very drying. So I just say that as a blanket statement, um, start looking at, you know, you know, of course we all want to be clean, but a lot of patients used to come in with me. I've washed five times with soap today and it's still not better. You know, oftentimes you can be overwashing. So simple things like that, using more natural soaps and avoiding soap and using um, non-soap soaps and just rinsing instead of overwashing can start reducing the dryness. But even with that, Sometimes you need help with creams and other modalities because it's just a function of menopause. Well, and with the commercials on TV, you would think that we need some kind of something that since for centuries women haven't had. <laughs> right. To clean. And That's I even heard mm -hmm. today of a men's, excuse my language, ball wash. Okay. And it's like, what? Why do there have to be these separate things? It's like, you know, for centuries, we've somehow survived, you know, just with soap. Yes. <laughs> well, that's why they call them soap operas, remember? Soap yeah. operas were sponsored by the soap companies in the 50s, yeah. right? <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah. so soap companies make a lot of yeah. money telling you that you're very dirty and you need more soap. You're just right? stinky, stinky. Yeah. Right? They when our soap. human bodies yeah. are supposed to have natural... Oh some natural hormones and pheromones and release. And yes, we yeah. all want to clean here with soap, but um, you know, below the belly button, we might just need a rinse. Just saying, yeah. I, I examine tender body parts on a daily basis. And I can tell you a lot of irritation can come from overwashing. And a lot of things can be made better by household type remedies, like a little coconut oil can go a long way. So I'm just going to say that, so. <laughs> right? Dryness yeah. and chafing, wash less coconut oil more, you know, unless you have a coconut allergy, but. And you'll um, just smell like Hawaii. Exactly. <laughs> so it's kind of back to common sense, but yes, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of soap being sold. Yeah. Good point. Anybody else have anything to share, comment, question? No, I think we're good. All Brett, right. are you still with us, Brett? I am. <laughs> I am indeed. This, um, soap talking. <laughs> oh, I, I just had this conversation all last week working a medical event for people of all genders at a cycling event. And it's, oh, it's yes. very, very it's very prevalent. I mean, and, and truly the comments that people said, it's like, I saw this on TV. I read this on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're having issues related to what they had because they weren't working it into their day-to-day -day life or their day-to-day -day lifestyle or their activities. And they didn't take that into account because that's not what the advertisement said. You know, so yeah, yeah. this is a very good, uh, the soap over soaping is a, is a very key <laughs> element. Yes. And new bumper stickers. Do not over soap. Correct. <laughs> correct. I like that. <laughs> All right. Well, if there's any is there any last question for Carrie that we haven't answered and that you want to pose to the group or to her specifically, please do so. And if not, well, I thank you all for joining us. I think we have a, a good crowd of women today. Hopefully I'll see some of those faces. Um, at the Women and Alzheimer's on the 21st. Um, we have, and I cannot think of his name right now, but we do have um, a renowned Valley neurologist. Um, and it starts with an S and I know his name and I can't think of it. But anyway, we'll be, we'll be answering 
and and this is more not like a workshop lecture we want it to be like a um a circle chat you know where we're just going to ask questions talk and find out some good information on how to keep our ourselves um from getting alzheimer's hopefully and is that in person only or will that be on it Zoom is in well? person only ah, yes, it is okay. in person only Okay. But masks Thanks. are fine if someone's comfortable to come and wear masks. We are all about wearing the mask, if, if at all. And it should be a small group anyway. So. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, well everyone, thank everyone. you so much. And uh, thank happy, you. happy hump day, whatever that means to anyone at this point in the world. And uh, <laughs> we will talk to everyone very soon with another lecture and some more updates before the summer break. Yep. Great. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Great audience. Thank you so much.